the truth is, while during our childhood we are constantly learning about reality and what to expect and how to respond, once we have those assumptions, we pretty much just stick with them through the rest of our adult life. Why? It would just simply be too cumbersome to always be walking around like willing to learn how to be human again fresh every day, you know, with no assumptions about what's about to happen and how should I respond. So once we kind of have the learning down, we just automate it and assume that those rules are gonna stick with us and we can use them in an unconscious way moving forward. The problem is those expectations or rules don't always serve us anymore. Why? Well, they're based on a reality we're no longer in. At the very least, we are no longer the same. We're not the same people. We're adults now. And as adults, we have different capacities and different options. We're also very, very likely around different people. And it's nice if our brain can like get that memo sort of. Now certainly we do learn from our adult experiences, but usually those learnings kind of exist in different memory systems so that the new learning can be parallel and in competition with the old without necessarily changing what we originally learned. And therapies like CBT do a good job of sort of bolstering or strengthening the new learning so it can compete and perhaps even override our original felt sense of reality. And that produces incremental change, which is a good thing. But today I wanna to talk to you about transformational change, to borrow a term from Bruce Ecker. And in transformational change, we actually go to the original learning itself, update it with new information, so that then whatever symptoms or struggles were sort of launched by this belief that I can't trust people or I have to always please them, whatever outcome from this belief can sort of naturally dissolve ongoingly without constantly having to try to override it or convince ourselves that it is a good idea to do something that is different than what our original learning taught us. So those original learnings traditionally have been called schemas. So we'll use that term. So some examples of schemas are, in order to get attention, I have to be perfect or I have to be bad. If I let myself feel sad, I'll be rejected. And then I'll be alone with the sadness in a way that's so overwhelming that I have to find a way to not let myself feel sadness. So these underlying associations and beliefs about how the world works, these schemas, they exist in something called implicit memory. Now scientists used to believe that implicit memory, once it was encoded, could not be changed. But now we do know that it is possible to update our implicit schemas. So there's all sorts of tricks that people have developed to make this process easier, many of which use imagination. One of my favorite of these is what's called doing parts work. In other words, picturing these little schemas as a little person. As crazy as that sounds, when we picture that as a, as a little personality or a little creature or person inside our mind, it makes it easier for the brain to both ask questions and listen for answers, simply because the brain's just much more um, accustomed to dialoguing with people. So if you picture it in that way, the brain's just on more familiar territory. And also these little schemas, they have within them uh, like a worldview, an expectation of reality, emotions, and uh, behavioral impulses, behavioral patterns. So if you think about it, in a way they are like these little simplified people or personalities. So actually the metaphor, that image, helps the brain kind of collect what otherwise could seem kind of complex into one image because we're used to people being that complex. We're used to them having a, a take on reality and a behavior. So that image actually will capture for us, um, like a, make it more concrete for our mind if we tune in to a behavioral pattern or a critical inner voice and say, okay, if that were a person, what would it look like? Okay, that's me at 10 years old, kind of curled up, I'm scared. And I'm telling myself these things. Or that's a part of me that's like really tough and trying to, you know, it's like a little um, scrappy, you know, inner part and she's angry. So we might begin to have an image like that simply because then we've like more localized that schema and can more comfortably begin to have a conversation or relationship with it. So we might ask the little girl who's in the corner like, okay, 
why are, what, are you, why, what are you doing there? Why are you so scared? Why are you curled up? Why are you disconnecting from everybody you love? And then if we asked it kindly, which interestingly, the rules of relationships still apply. Like if we go to a part of our mind and are critical, like, God, why are you so afraid? Get over it. We're not going to get information. <laughs> but if we go nicely and really sincerely ask, then that part will give us the response back and begin to like open for us the information that is held in that part of the brain. So there are many forms of therapy that work this way with parts, most famously internal family systems. There's even a book called Self Therapy that teaches you how to work with your own parts in that manner. But whatever technique you use, the important thing is to figure out what your mind believes. And when you're approaching that mission, the first step is to start with where you're suffering. So figure out what point of suffering or what pattern that either causes me pain or causes me to get stuck. What is it that I don't like about my own way of processing life? It's easiest if you can start with a behavioral response, like something you actually do, like criticizing yourself or gosh, I always nag at my husband or I always shut down when someone's giving me a compliment. But you can also start with just an anxious feeling or a depressed mood. But either way, begin to bring it into focus. If you do it like with parts work, you might see a person or you might just find it in your body. Like this is where that place lives. And then other images like a black hole or an animal might come, but sure enough, information will begin to come into awareness, like associations that can give some meaning as to what's the beliefs that underlie either that feeling or that behavioral pattern. So let's just say the pattern is self-criticism. So you might tune in, you might picture the inner critic if you want to do it with parts and ask it, what are you afraid would happen if you stopped criticizing me? Again, that's what we're getting toward. What are you afraid would happen if you stopped doing X, Y, and Z? Or if you don't want to do parts work, you can just tune into, God, when I'm feeling self-critical, there's like this tightness in my chest. And you might just stay there and say, okay, and fill in the sentence, I must be self-critical. I must tell myself I'm bad because if I don't, and just see what comes. Try it a number of times. I must tell myself I'm bad because if I don't. Begin to let the sort of coherent, meaningful, like the, the way that this actually does make sense and it is a weird way, adaptive or a solution to a problem, beginning to assume it's there and letting that information emerge. If it really doesn't feel like an adaptation, like it just feels like a sadness, and maybe you can even identify a part, like that's me at 10 years old when my dad died or something. Well, it may be more like a memory of an emotion or an emotional truth of like aloneness because there really was a time you were alone. In that moment, the, the next step would be to just show up for that part and give support, love, self-compassion, connection, in a way that is actually a disconfirmation because it's saying, oh, there's this deep sense of aloneness, but I'm here. But sometimes just giving care to a place that's simply scared or hurting can be a wonderful first step.